It's with great pleasure that Prostate Calgary welcomes Hella Eagletail. I'm sure many of you have read his biography in our April edition of the Digital Examiner. But what you may not know is that Hal Eagletail is a traditional knowledge keeper. He's a contributor to the Indigenous Education newsletter published by the Calgary Board of Education. He's also contributed videos to the University of Calgary. And last year, working with the Elbow River Watershed, completed four short videos sharing his knowledge on various water topics. In January of 2023, the University of Alberta published a book entitled Walking Together, Working Together. In the book, Hal Eagletail contributed to a chapter titled Bringing Traditional Medicine into the Med Medical System. This collection takes a holistic view of well-being, seeking complementaries between Indigenous approaches to healing and Western biomedicine. I had the privilege of meeting Hal recently, and while he's considered to be a traditional knowledge keeper, I would argue that based on what I learned of Hal, he is also a knowledge sharer, and he is always willing to share his vast knowledge. So it is my great honor to introduce Hal Eagletail. Waters. Oh, yes, thank you. Put my timer on. Tatanast at the Danse, okay. Omba wash day. Ani. Bonjour, come at the Peltu, je m'appelle Hal Eagle Tail. Any Germans? Und hang sick on Hal Adler Schweif. I thank you, Brad, for this tobacco offering. And I thank you, Bob, for the smudge offering. You can take the smudge out now, we're, we're, we're smudged with everything. Okay. So tobacco <clears throat> significance is that when Creator made all creation, tobacco was the first plant he gifted Mother Earth with. And it's a plant that we give back to the Earth whenever we take anything out, medicines, animals, anything that of, of Mother Earth's value, we offer the tobacco. The smudge is a purification of the air filtering the, the bacteria, the viruses, insects, but it was also a connection with spirit world. And when COVID first hit, we lit our smudge almost 24 seven. And this is what prevented my family from contracting COVID. We also used our traditional herbal medicines that, uh, that, that protected us as well. <clears throat> I'm going to share a little history of my people, Tsutina, and also a technique on how we activate our, our ability to heal ourselves. Every single one of us has this gift. Every single one of us on earth, creator's creation, gave us this blessing to heal ourselves. We're just caught up in our lives. We're just caught up in our, our, our jobs, raising our children, fighting traffic cheering on the poor flames <laughs> but we all have this gift and i'm going to share our traditional gift with each and every one of you on how to heal yourself before i do that the tobacco that i received from brad is in a loose tobacco form so i need to ask brad did you supply any rolling papers <laughs> I think after Prime Minister Justin Trudeau legalized a certain plan, we all have rolling papers. <laughs> In Canada, there's over 600 native bands and 11 language groups. My language group, Tsutina, belong to the Dene, Athabascan speaking people. We stretch from Alaska down to Mexico. Our language dialect comes from the Aztec people from South America. You have to visualize North America as one big ice shelf during the Ice Age. The congregation of our migration started from Mexico and our people, which is the most numerous indigenous nations in North America, 
the Navajo, the Apache. That was the start of our migration. As the ice receded along the west coast, we followed that thaw. And we settled in today, California, Oregon, Washington, British Columbia, as far north as Alaska. And there was a land bridge between Alaska and Russia, and our people ventured there as well. Today, they're known as the Ket people. And we've been trying to get a, a, a meeting with the Ket. However, the, the Russian government, I guess Putin, doesn't want us to deal with land claims. No. <laughs> so we're looking forward to one day hearing the language as well as the oral stories of our, of our Ket relatives. The second thaw happened along what they call the Hudson's, uh, the Mackenzie River to the Hudson's Bay. So our people followed that melt into northern Alberta, Saskatchewan, Manitoba, Northwest Territories, Yukon. And because we're the first inhabitants after the ice, we're the highest population of indigenous people in North America, the Athabascan Dene. We got the most casinos. <laughs> but we did have a story of evolution and separation. One such story happened crossing a frozen body of water. Half were across the ice, getting onto the ice, the other half. When those on the ice, a young child seen a horn sticking out of the ice and cried for it. The grandmother took out her stone axe and started chipping at this horn, not realizing our story. That horn was attached to a monster li living under the ice, sleeping under the ice. We call it Tusklana. As that vibration woke up this Tusklana, it stood up, busting the ice, separating our people. The Navajo have the same story, except them they say it's a buffalo horn with a frozen carcass encased in the ice. And the chipping and the weight of the people busted the ice. The Dene up north have the same story, except them they say it was an elk horn with a frozen carcass encased in the ice. Whatever story and difference in horn, the moral is the same of this, of this separation. In life, the man always walks in front of the woman except on ice. <laughs> I'm just teasing. Never spoil the children. Never give the crying child everything that they heart's content. Because this devastation happened by that grandmother spoiling that crying child. This separation ventured us across this great continent. We had a second separation. Before this happened, we had a great event happen to our people. A sacred bundle, water bundle, all the animals, all the birds, was gifted to our people through the supernatural powers, not a man-made bundle, 3,500 years ago. And as we were migrating along the mountain range, we had a second separation with the Fort St. John Dene in British Columbia today. A dog went into a leader's teepee, ate its dry meat, and the leader killed the dog, and the family, big family fight ensued, and our people ventured out of the mountain onto the prairie with that beaver bundle. Today, we still have in our possession the sacred beaver <coughs> bundle of all the Dene people. My late father was the carrier of this bundle. When he passed seven years ago, Myself and my brother became the carrier of this sacred bundle. As we came onto the prairie, our first encounter was with the Blackfoot Confederacy, the Blood Tribe. And there is a, a risk of war amongst our nations on first contact. However, our Sutina history and our guerrilla warfare techniques prevented an all-out battle. Our warriors used to peg themselves to the ground and tie a rawhide on that peg to their, to their ankles. And as the 
as the Blackfoots came over the hill and they seen all these Sutina warriors pegged to the ground, knowing they're going to stay there and fight in one place rather than run away. It gave us uh, an encouraging reflection of peace opportunity. And we became back allies with the Blackfoot people. And they taught us how to live on the prairies, how to hunt the buffalo, how to use the teepee, how to use the, the plants and, and, and the animals. They introduced us to the teepee culture. And whoever invented the teepee must have been a genius because in the winter time, the heat stays down and slowly goes up. In the summertime, you can lift up the skirts of the teepee and have a natural air conditioned flow into the teepee. And they also made it circular. This way, your wife can't corner you. <laughs> but we adopted this teepee cultural lifestyle. And our indigenous nations always adapted to their environment. You look at the teepee or the home style, you'll see what I'm talking about. Our West Coast relatives built the longhouse, invented the bunk bed, invented communal living because their environment didn't have to follow the buffalo herds and, and have a mobile home to follow these great herds across the, the plains. As far north as the, the Grand Prairies, as far south as the southern plains of Texas and Oklahoma. Our relatives to the east have the wigwam culture, home style. Our relatives further east and that have the fortification culture and agriculture that they possess, the corn, the squash, the, the pumpkins. Our relatives way up north amongst the, the high Arctic igloo culture. So just by the home style of our geographical area dictated the way those home dwellings were built. So we're not all just teepee culture. This is a Hollywood misinterpretation. We're not all just headdress feathers culture. Another stereotype. We're our own worst enemy actually. I see teepees outside the longhouses in Victoria or in Parliament in Ottawa. I see the chiefs way out there on the AFN having headdresses where headdresses never occurred or, or existed. So we need to be proud of our dress. We need to be proud of our foods and our culture and our identity. And this is our reconciliation amongst ourselves that we're going through. So. Once we evolved with the Blackfoot Confederacy, learned the ways of the star wheel, there's a great misconception of uh, what they call medicine wheel. The spokes of this star wheel lined up with the star clusters. And it gave us a map and a calendar on when to start harvesting the medicines. And, and things get distorted. So I don't know how medicine wheel come about, but originally it's a star wheel. And it connects with the constellations that we use on our teepees. On the ears, we'll have a five circles on this ear, Cassiopeia. On the other ear, seven circles, Big Dipper. And right in the back, the Polaris or the North Star. These were our navigation <clears throat> tools that we used. So everything that we, that we know of our harvest and our medicines and the migrations of the animals and birds was through that knowledge of the star constellations, the star wheels. There was a great time of, uh, of war that happened in the States. In 1876, there's a great battle amongst the the Hakpakpa Sioux, Sitting Bull, in the greasy hills known as the Little Bighorn in Montana, Southern Montana. 
in uh, June 26, 1876. This great battle wasn't just the Sioux, it was the Cheyenne, the Paiute, the Arapaho, there was Crees, there was Blackfoots, there was Tsutina, Dene, there was all nations that gathered there that, that you hear little about in the history books, but in our oral stories, we all helped each other in these great battles. It was a success. However, the US government was, was out to persecute Sitting Bull. So he came up to Canada. And when he came to Canada, he gathered all of our Treaty 7 chiefs. And he said, with all this great power of warriors here, we have enough strength here to push all the settlers back. But our chiefs said, the white mother, who we call the queen, she wants to make peace. We're hearing of stories of peace coming. The white father, who we call the president, the United States, wants to make war rather than peace. So we have no reason to fight. Sitting Bull was forced back. We replenished his horses and his food stores. And he gave us two gifts, one called Tall Hat Society. The Sioux flow back headdress that we proudly wear. He transferred that right to us. Our headdresses were actually all, the feathers were straight up like that. And we gave that straight up to the woman and the man wear the flow back. And then they gave us what we call a parted hair society, which is a peacekeepers or security of the camp. Today we call it Tuskuna, and that's the name of our Sutina tribal police, the Tuskuna. As part of these traditional concepts we call societies, there is a, a healing society, a part of all of this, the medicine people. And the medicine people were the richest amongst our nation members because people gifted them rifles, blankets, hides, horses, for their knowledge of, of the healing medicines. And the leader, treaties made the term chief. It was a government term, chief. We had clan leaders. And every clan had a, a spokesperson. But for government to deal with all these spokespeople, they, they, they said to the, the treaty signing process, just select one leader, we'll call him chief, to talk on behalf of everybody. So this is how this term chief come about. The chiefs were the poorest amongst our people because they gave everything of themselves for the benefit of, of, the, of the members. The spiritual people were the richest because of their healing abilities. These healing knowledge has been passed down from one generation to the next. Since the coming of the European people 500 years ago, you look at how our first contact was. The first European people were lost at sea. They came onto our eastern shores dressed in rags starving. So our people lined them up, fed them, clothed them, taught them how to survive. And when you look at that first lineup of European people off the boats, that was the very first America welfare line. <laughs> it was that generosity spirit of our people to share and to be giving. So we start sharing our plants, knowledge, our healing, medicine properties. Today, 65% of Western medicine from the pharmacy came from an indigenous herbal treatment. And we're always getting our, our knowledge stolen. The most recent theft is acetaminophen. This is 
the willow bark. And the theft before this one was echinacea. And echinacea was shared by a Sioux medicine man in his sweat lodge to a, a doctor visiting his nation and experienced the sweat lodge ceremony. And he inquired, what is this you use? He shared that knowledge. This doctor took this knowledge to the pharmaceutical companies. He's a billionaire today. The pharmaceutical companies are making billions. This spiritual medicine leader still lives in poverty. So our willingness to share these knowledges of these medicines is still a part of our cultural belief. And this is what I'm here to share tonight. I'm here to share techniques that will help with the prostate cancers. My father, my late father, my late mother both had cancers. My father started smoking cigarettes at 12 years old. He died in his 80s. He was a warrior in the, uh, the US Army. He heard the horror stories of the Canadian government and the Canadian Army mistreating our, our war vets that came out of World War II. If you're indigenous, you had to give up your treaty rights in order to get pension, in order to, to get land or any benefits. So when the Korean conflict came, he didn't want to go through that. He went down into the United States to join the U.S. Army. He didn't want to go through that tragedy of giving your life for your country when you don't get nothing back. So he went down into the United States, joined the U.S. Army. He was actually picked up by a patriotic trucker just outside of Calgary, Midnapur. This trucker took him right to Seattle, paid us food. He was very patriotic. He was really happy. He was going to join up and enlist. He did not get roll call when it came to mail. Never. He never had anyone writing him from home. My late mother, she came from Saddle Lake, a little bit further uh, central Alberta. And she was taught the herbal medicines from her mother and grandparents. And she, she developed a, a, a love for, for medicine healing. So she came to Calgary to become a nurse. And she, she trained at the old uh, Holy Cross Hospital. And that's where she got her nursing. My uncle, my, my late mom's uh, half-brother, from Sutina, said to my, my mom, mail and make a letter to my, my brother in the army. So she decided she'll start writing pen pals with my, my father. And he was so shocked to be called that, that mail call. Eagle tail, letter! And he's just beyond belief. And next thing, there's this lady writing him. They start pen paling back and forth, back and forth. And she's saying, send me a picture, send me a picture of you. And he couldn't, uh, he didn't get his army issued pictures yet. So he went down to the local bus depot, black and white instance, put his nickel in, got a slab of four pictures, tried to pick the best one he thought, sent that to her, and my mom said, when I, I looked at his picture, she said, he was so dark. And he had a real greasy head. It was just shiny. I never wrote back to him. And then he got his, uh, his army issued colored and uniform. And just looked so handsome. He sent that to her. She, within a week, she was writing again. And then they started a family. They started to raise or name us alphabetically. And I think that was my father's uh, organizing skills from the US Army. But he named 
10 of their children alphabetically oldest to youngest. And I'm the letter H, kind of right in the middle now. And because my mom was in the residential school up in St. Paul, uh, Blue Quills, she was really strong Catholic belief. My father was a very strong traditionalist belief and uh, practice. So we grew up with either a Catholic uh, or a traditional upbringing. I took an interest to in my mom's herbal knowledge, and it was so enlightening to know the medicines and the times to start picking and, and what we need to, to offer and to listen for these medicines. These medicines speak to us. They, the plants talk to us. The trees talk to us. And you're going to find out probably within the next three to four years, you're going to start hearing studies from scientists saying, we've analyzed the sounds that the grass makes when we mow them. There's a frequency they give off. They're actually screaming when we mow them. So whenever I mow the lawn, I'll put tobacco down. I'll offer this earth song. And I'll tell the grass spirit, forgive us for cutting you, but we got bylaws. <laughs> but you're going to start hearing about how we've known of the existence of all this connection with all living things from a scientific level. And we've contributed many contributions to the scientific committee, uh, community. The most recent was the hantavirus. Scientists and doctors could not figure out where the hantavirus was coming from. Out of exhaustion of researching and trying to identify, someone suggested, ask the spiritual people of the Navajo. So they had a ceremony with the Navajo spiritual leaders. And after this ceremony, the Navajo elders told the doctors and scientists, check the rodents. Check the rodents, that's where this hantavirus is coming from. So they did a deeper study, and they found that whenever there's a pinion nut bloom, every four or five years, there's a rodent bloom with, with the amount of feed. And it's the droppings of the rodents. Once, once airborne, the hantavirus exists. And this is how they found out where hantavirus was coming from. So there's much collaboration and cooperation that we still need to embark on in society. And this is why Alberta Health Services, 30 years ago, you couldn't come into the hospitals with your traditional medicine. Doctors would shun you out. Today, you go in a hospital, there's a traditional wellness counselor that's there to help with your belief of your herbal treatments or your spiritual treatments. They allow these ceremonies. My late father opened up the uh, South Health Campus with all of the other denominations to bless the chapel in the South Health Campus. And he was the last to get up and bless. And he said, with all the different denomination leaders there, when I see all the prayers of the earth here blessing the same site for whoever comes to use it, it reminds me of a teepee without its covers. Every one of you represent a pole of this teepee that all goes straight up the Creator. And just like those beliefs cross and those poles cross, we all have very similar belief to be a good person to be a humble person so never question what makes a person humble because our prayers continue up to creator and on the way home i said dad who's those beliefs on the ears they don't actually touch the rest of the teepee without hesitation he said that's business and government <laughs> the responsibility of those poles is to protect the teepee from smoking they'll rotate the with however the direction of the winds coming in and this is the role that business and government play. 
So if business and government aren't doing their job, we're all up in smoke. The admin staff loved this analogy so much at the South Health Comp campus that they asked our family after he had passed away to use that analogy as a, par a part of the display that you now see at South Health campus. So when you go to the Allied Care, the chapel at South Health, you'll see his analogy on the wall of how every religious beliefs are like those poles. We all go straight up the Creator. And he used to say that in spirit world, Creator doesn't differentiate between, between race or language or, or color of your skin. And he said that Creator gives us an example 24-7. Every man, woman, and child, every race on Mother Earth, we're all the same in spirit world because we all have the same color shadow. No one on this earth is going to stand side by side and have a different lighter shade, darker shade shadow. This is his example for us in spirit world. So these medicines that we use or the spiritual activation of them is, is how we, we help overcome our sicknesses and, and, and these cancers, diabetes, all of these sicknesses of the earth that, that plagues our bodies. And my late mother had throat cancer. She had this big growth. The doctor gave her six months to live. So we took her down to our relatives in the Navajo. We had ceremony. She was given a special uh, treatment, drink, herbal medicines. And the spiritual leader said that within four days, this growth is going to burst. And expect your mom to get worse before she starts getting better. The next morning in our hotel room, it burst. Just this pus and blood, all this came out. And because all of that poison was coming out and it was going back through her system, she got really sick, but didn't start flushing out. Next thing, she started getting better. And she wasn't with us another six months. She was with us another six years. Until the, uh, the last Christmas dinner she was with us, she told the family, this will be my last Christmas dinner. I'm going to go. And everyone say, don't talk like that, Mom. But she was dead on. She was right. It was her last Christmas dinner. And because she was so strong in the Catholic faith, she got sick before Easter. And she said, I'm going to suffer two weeks for Jesus. He suffered for us. So at the Rocky View Hospital, she was there for, for two weeks. And right on Easter Thursday morning, she left us. She did exactly what she said she's going to do. She foreseen this ability that we all have. Now, how, how do we interpret our, our spiritual connections with all living things? We have a belief system. The medicines we use in Western medicine, the surgeries we get, if we believe in them, they'll help us. 70% of your healing comes from your belief. 30% that medicine, 30% that surgery. And I'm going to share a technique on how to, to channel that and how to get, it, get that into your thinking, into your proper daily routines. But before I go there, I want to explain a couple of things that I experienced when I worked with Alberta Health Services. I was one of those traditional wellness counselors that went to the hospitals and provided herbal treatment and, and, and also spiritual treatment. I worked with a, a quadriplegic, got into a serious accident, he had a halo on, he had an orderly bringing him in into the, into the prayer room. Couldn't talk, couldn't move. And I started him on a medicine that helps activate the electrical impulses in the brain and in the spine. 
And I just had him smell it. Just inhale it. Bless you. Bless you. Make a wish. And after three months, he came in and he said, look at this. He lifted his arm up. About another two and a half months, he came in, wheeling himself. And about eight months, he came in on a walker. He still calls me today, even though I don't work for AHS anymore. Inboxes me, tells me he's still doing good. He's walking now. He's living a good life. But it wasn't not just conventional or, or, or traditional. It was his belief that got him there. So when I'm doing research with AHS, I started looking at other original medicines. I don't call it Western medicine, and I don't call it holistic medicine. I call it the original medicines of the different cultures of the world. In China, I was watching a video, a brain tumor patient, they had a, a big screen like this, and they had an ultrasound, and in real time, you can see that tumor in the patient's brain right on the screen. And then the doctors, two of them, herbalists, they came to the patient, and then they started meditating, and then they start chanting, cancer, go away, cancer, go away, cancer, go away, cancer, go away. And in real time, that tumor starts shrinking. That's the ability we have as human people. But it's like I said, we don't practice it because we're too caught up in working and raising family and fighting traffic. We don't take the time to sit by that river or that on that mountain or by that ocean and give thanks, and get to your spirit spot. We don't have the time today. And this is what we need to re reteach each other, the ability for us to heal ourselves. We all have it. We even have psychic abilities. We even have the ability to talk to the spirits. And the ones that are, are the most strongest connection is the young people in life. When they grow up, sometimes you'll hear a child, I have an imaginary friend. What does society do? Take them to the psych ward, give them pills, suppress all that. When a child in our native community says something like that, we'll nurture that gift, we'll bring them in ceremony, we'll help them understand and filter out that connection so that they can use that ability to help themselves and help others. A lot of our children have anxiety or, or depression. It's because spirits constantly trying to get through to them. They got this energy that's so bright that spirit is identified by that, attracted by that. So we help them through ceremony filter it. And now this depression or this anxiety turns into a, a, an, an ability to, to be helpful in ceremony or, or even in psychic abilities. I do the switch for the Calgary City Police for the cultural sensitive training. I had one specific lady, non-native woman, come in with all of these signs, these anxiety, depressions, and in this ceremony, we cleaned her frequency that she's now a practicing psychic. She cleared all of this friction and this static. And now she can understand. Very powerful, very amazing, and, and very uh, reflection, reflective of of the gifts we all possess as human people. So we're going to share this technique. It's very simple. There's nothing, nothing miraculous about it. 
It's just activating your ability to heal yourself on a cellular level. There's no medication. There's no threat because uh, Brad was talking about they don't endorse anything like this. Well, it has nothing to do with medicine. It has nothing to do with physician. It just has an ability for you to connect with yourself. And all the cultures have these, these, these um, techniques. It's called yoga. <laughs> Same thing. It's called uh, Tai Chi. Same thing. You're connecting with your cellular self. So, <clears throat> the smudge that was lit, the incense that it provides for us, it's got a connection with all of our, our spiritual energies. Um, when I was 17, I had a near-death experience. I felt Creator's beautiful, wonderful spirit, spirit world. And try to imagine your most exciting, happiest day on Mother Earth. Try to imagine that, that feeling you had on that most ex happiest day. Times that feeling by 1,500. That's not even close to how spirit world felt. I didn't even want to come back to this world. But now, I know what to expect. And I'm so looking forward to it. So, when I had this experience, I can see the, the aura. It's like... Um, it's like when you're driving on the highway and look down the highway and you see that mirage of heat emanating off the highway in the distance. That's what I see around people. There's no light, there's no color. It's like an energy. And from my knowledge as to what to expect when we leave this world, I have to be sensitive. I have to be sensitive to people that's never experienced this. So, a lot of things just bounce off of me. I don't carry anyone's negative energy, negative thoughts, negative words, negative opinions. It's just like a bulletproof vest bounces off of me. So, I'm going to guide you. First of all, you have to go to your spirit spot. This is a place that belongs only to you. A place and a memory on Mother Earth that was so beautiful that this is your own. This, is, this just belongs to your memory. Could be in the mountains, could be in the, by the ocean, could be in another country, could be the parking lot of McDonald's. This spirit spot belongs to you. And I want you to visualize yourself there. Now, we have a guardian angel that they say in the good book. We call it spirit guide, same thing. But it's, it's also our conscience, our conscience telling us right from wrong. Our conscience is always battling good and bad, always gonna be, that's why they call it balance because good and bad has to be constantly fighting over you. And this spot that only belongs to you, I want you to visualize yourself there, <coughs> feel the energy of it, and also see a, a fire, green flame. Envision a green flame. And I'm going to sing a song. And as I sing this song, I want you to visualize the holy people, the ones that had gone on ahead of us, your relatives, your loved ones. I want you to see them, just the tops of their heads, visualize looking to the east and just seeing all prairie. And you see the top of their heads getting closer and closer with the song. And when the song is over, they're right beside you in your spirit spot. And then you want to tell them where you need healing. Could be a physical pain, emotional, spiritual. Only you know what, what pains you. You gotta be honest with them, tell them. 
cancer is always a tricky one because it's like an octopus. It's got all these tentacles that can spread. So what you've got to do first of all is roll up every tentacle. Visualize that. Roll up every tentacle of this cancer spreading into a ball. And then I want you to visualize your guiding spirits, your relatives, your loved ones, putting their hands into that cancer and pulling out this black tar dripping off their hands. And then they put it into that green flame and it lights up. Then they go back in for more. Bring it out. Take care of it. Go back in. Less is coming out. Less and less and less and less. Finally, their hands are clear. Visualize your hands are clear coming out of you. When you do this very simple technique, you're telling your body on a cellular level where to heal itself. You know, growing up, we always had warts as kids. How the heck do you get out of these ugly warts? We used to go down to the river. My mom would rub a, take a river stone, I'll put some tobacco down, give some prayer, rub a, a river stone onto the wart. And within the next week and a half, the wart starts disappearing. What she did was she took the bacteria off that stone and put it onto the wart, and the body told itself, there's a foreign entity that we didn't know that it was out there. Now that bacteria activated the body's ability to catch it and to heal it. So this is how we have the ability to heal ourselves. Every single one of us. We just need to tap into it in the techniques. So visualize your spirit spot. As I start singing, see your aura, your light, your, your energy, and put it into the earth, like the roots of a tree. Make a strong connection. See those roots going all out. And then through your body, push your energy as far as you can project it above you. And as I sing your relatives in, see them coming closer and closer. And at the end of this song, They'll be there giving you that healing ability. And you can use this technique whenever you get up in the morning. You can use it with your relatives sitting in the hospital bed right now. You can use it anytime. And use it as much as you can because you're activating your own healing power. When we sing, we sing in the language of Mother Earth. All living things are communicating. That's why we sing the way we do as native people. We're singing in the language of all living things. In our ceremony, we may sing that buffalo song for their guiding spirit strength, or that bear. And we don't call them mammals, we call them our brothers, our sisters. That's how we view all living things. So visualize your spirit spot. Visualize.
worst enemy when it comes to thinking that uh, colonialism and uh, and uh, capitalism is the way to go. I was asked, I was doing the, the presentation uh, for Premier Kenny. We did the UCP um, opening at the Grey Eagle when they had their uh, annual general meeting. And when I got on stage, <clears throat> I started off by acknowledging we all got through COVID and all the social distancing. But I have to be honest, I said, that I'm an anti-vaxxer. And everyone's like, oh, you know, and Kenny's standing there, the premier. And I said, yes, I got four antis vaccinated. <laughs> and we all need antis in our lives. I have antibiotic, anti-freeze, uh, anti-racism, anti-depressants. So. And man, you should have seen the relief that came over him. <laughs> The interpretation of, of, of how we work together is a reflection of respecting all living things. And I was asked, well, what is colonialism? And how do we decolonize? And I simply thought about one of our most powerful cancer medicines, the most powerful, more powerful than, than chemo. Dandelion. And what does colonialism do? Eradicate that weed. It's a nuisance. They put budgets to get rid of it. Oh, well, how do you decolonize? Let the schools, the corporations, let society harvest it and utilize its cancer killing abilities. That's how we decolonize. Respect the simplest medicine that grows as a nuisance in our society along the sidewalk. I wouldn't use it for the you know first five to seven years. We need, because of all the pesticide that we put on it, and it's in the soil. So what I would say is, let's harvest it and let's compost it for five, seven years. Let's not put any more chemicals on them in the, in the ground. Allow Mother Earth to heal itself. And then we can start utilizing the gift of that most powerful cancer medicine, dandelions. So I want to know if there's any questions. If anyone has any thoughts or opinions or interpretations that they'd like to ask or share. If there's anyone online that are asking in the chat room. Hiya. I got a question. You were, uh, excuse me, I really enjoyed that, Al. Um, you were saying that um, the power is within, so it's got to it's gotta be a belief. So uh, I've tried a lot of natural remedies in my journey, mm -hmm. uh, but I'm uncertain of if I really believe in them or not. Mm -hmm. And if I don't believe in them, then are they, what are the odds that they're going to work? I'll give you a technique on how to activate them as well. So, simply water. You ever hear of how when they, when they bless it, it changes the, the, uh, the composition on the cellular level? You put regular tap water under a microscope and analyze its molecules. And then you take that same tap water and you pray on it. You get a minister or spiritual leader give a blessing prayer on it, and you put it under that same microscope, you'll see how it changed its form in a mono molecule level. You'll, you'll see the physical change. So when we take a medicine, <clears throat> whether it's conventional pill form or, or, or However, it's interpreted, it could be a medicine we get from Earth. You have to believe in it by projecting yourself into it. So if it's a plant, I'll project myself 
into the heart of this plant. I'll visualize going into the plant through the mu uh, nucleus of it. And I'll see its light. That's its heart. I'll, I'll visualize its light of this plant. When I see that, I'll tell the plant, I need you to heal this or this. This is what I'm asking for this strengthening. And when you do that, you're actually believing in it. You're seeing it and you're visualizing the mental state of it, how it looks. Then you'll believe in it. That's how you learn how to believe in something. You put yourself into its actual visual, into the nucleus of it. And that's how we activate our medicines. It could be uh, in a pill form. Because you know that pill form eventually came from something from Mother Earth anyways. This is how we activate it in our ceremonies. And this is something that a lot of our spiritual people don't share because they want your business, you know, they want your return business to come back. But it was like Brad said at the beginning, I'm here to share these gifts. And I'm hoping in the future we'll have a herbal shop like you'll see in Chinatown. You go down to Chinatown, you see all that herbal medicine. It's a billion dollar industry for them, but they have so much belief in it. They're 5,000 years ahead of us in, in terms of the evolution. And it's been 500 years that we've had contact. But I would like to see our, our hospitals offer, and, and, and there is a hospital in Saskatchewan that called Fort Capel. It's a Western medicine hospital, but they also have a wing for traditional healing, sweat lodge, sun dance, herbal treatment, spiritual blessings, the smudge, the prayer. They also have that option. So Tinna, we're looking at building a hospital with the same kind of concept, with all of the Western, but also the spiritual and traditional herbal treatments. Give people an option. You can do both. You believe in both. Any other questions? Al, how are you teaching young people? Are there enough young people with an interest in learning about these medicines? I tried to establish a college of spiritual leaders like they have for doctors, for nurses, when I was with AHS. I cannot get past the bureaucracy to accept that. They do, however, have this in existence amongst the Navajo and amongst the, the Sioux, and they can verify legitimate people of, 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 of transferred rights and, and powers, and, and they'll verify, yes, they got the right to run that lodge, yes, they got the right to use that medicine for you. We need that legislative support. We need the government of Alberta to come in and say, only indigenous people can treat the indigenous knowledge. And it already exists, this legislative support in Hawaii. In Hawaii, they have a Polynesian College of Herbal Medicine, but you have to be Polynesian to attend. You'll become a certified nurse and you'll be able to administer your Polynesian herbal treatments and spiritual knowledge. And it's got legislative support. They're 20 years ahead of us. That's what we need to do with our governments here. They talk about reconciliation. This is one form of how we can reconcile that, bring it forward. How we get the young people in is the, um, the genre that they live in which is technology. We have a language app of Sutina language. You can download it, you can learn Sutina language, you can learn Cree language, you can learn Sioux language. This is how we utilize the young people's way of life, their lifestyle, is use technology, create programs that will share this knowledge of medicine building, rather than, than you know, these violent games that they play, you know, and all of these killing things that they play. Let's level up to become a spiritual leader. 
you know, teach them the basics, the yellow hand work, the helpers of the, the medicine people, and then they become apprentice, and then they become uh, transferred rights, and then they, you know, they level up with this exact knowledge in the real world on their video game. You see, young people are so immersed in, in the lang in the IT and today and the technology that they don't even know what a snag and blanket is at Apollo anymore. You know, a snag and blanket is you, at the end of the power, you'll have someone wrapped in the blanket with you. And that's a successful snag and blanket. Today, the kids just go on the, the dating apps. That's their snag and blanket, the dating apps. But I got to remind these young ones that Ancestry.ca is not a dating app. It's a Lies, I can't suppose it. So, any other questions? Um, do you have, Al, do you have any um, thing on your website? Do you have a website? No, I don't have a website. I do, however, have a, um, a, a sweat house and a healing home. We turned my late parents' home into a healing home where we can practice our traditional medicines, um, teach the young ones these songs, prepare them for ceremonies. Um, I had Minister Wilson come and tour the, uh, the site. He loves the concept. And I told Minister uh, Wilson, Alberta Indigenous Minister, if you can fund this healing home, it'll be like a pilot. And he said, if we can do something here, and fund the, 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 the preservation of your spiritual practice. What a 360 turnaround from government policy to eradicate it and to, to try to get rid of it. I said, exactly. And maybe we can have a healing home on every First Nation, every um, urban setting, you know, municipality setting. What a, what a, a proper way to evolve uh, and, and to teach the young people. So communication is the key. I found out this weekend. Um, we went up to Edmonton for a Native Provincial Hockey Tournament and communication with your spouse is very key to health. <laughs> and she told me that she wanted me to take her out to the to the place where they, they prepare the food in front of you. So I took her to Subway. <laughs> <laughs> and it wasn't the right no. communication there. Right concept. You know, yeah, yeah. I appeased the preparation of food in front, but she didn't say Japanese village. Yeah. <laughs> well, thank you, everybody. Good. See you, guys.